Is it a fundamental mistake to think that the world and consciousness are purely material? Is it possible for fact-checking to be impartial? What makes a scientific theory successful? That should be the common ground here. Just a small correction. Yeah. You said, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Be sure I will correct you even if you are right. Okay, so... You... <laughs> <laughs> Christoph, one of the problems that we all wrestle with is that we have this perception of ourselves as some kind of a unity. I, I'm a me. And yet, when I think about it, we have all these diverse uh, inputs of sight and sound and sensation, and all of the molecules of my body have been replaced uh, over the last years. So how, how am I me? Well, I think it's, an, it's, it's not something that just happens passively. It's an active. Uh, it's an act of computation that the brain has to perform to keep on running this module, this self-module that keeps up this this feeling, this person that I'm still me. Although, as you said, I'm even physically not identical to the person I was a year ago, let alone um, you know, let alone five or ten years ago. And it, it involves a number of of processes. One of them is um, called the binding. You know, because one of the remarkable thing about what I experience is I experience everything coming together. I don't when I see you. You know, I can see your face and your color, etc. I can hear your voice, but it's all tied together. Your voice comes out of your out of out of the mouth, right? And I know who you are. I know something about you, and all of that percept who you are and what you talk and and where you are located and what colors you have on. All of those are put together in one single percept, and so that's again that's an act of computation, an act of operation that the brain has to perform. That's probably key to uh, to consciousness. And so the question is, how, how does the brain do it? So, how does the brain uh, do it, this binding? It seems like there may be two questions here. One is this binding problem, which is, which is a, a real problem of how do we get neurophysiologically all of these different sensory modalities plus, plus other internal states and thoughts and memories into the impression or the reality of some kind of a unity? Yes. So that's one of the problems. And, and people have proposed, I mean, so for example, Francis Crick and I have proposed that uh, one way this could be done is using um, using a particular type of signal called a 40 hertz oscillatory signal, that there's a specific mechanism in the brain that this could achieve this um, this binding. Whether that's actually the case, that remains to be seen. Uh, describe that a little bit. What do you mean by that? Well, so if you look at the way ne uh, neurons fire, so think about the, the analogy is a Christmas tree with electric candles. So think about a Christmas tree that has 20 billion electric candles, so a very, very big tree. And each each of candle these, being like a neuron in exactly. our brain. And each candle flickers b briefly. And that's uh, a neuron, if you actually, um, you know, electrically listen to a neuron, as it were, you can hear a little discharge, I mean, you can put it on an audio monitor, and that's the way neurons communicate. The way they communicate is using these pulses. It's an asynchronous pulse system. And so you have these candles, and each, they flicker. Now, um, Binding means that this, these, you know, thousand candles over here and these, you know, hundred thousand here and those twenty thousand there, they all belong to the same percept. How do you do that? Well, one way to do it, for example, they can all uh, fire simultaneously. Another way, they can all sort of fire with some with some periodicity. Let's say they all fire every forty milliseconds on average, with a lot of jitter. Every twenty fifth, um, every fortieth of a um, of a um, of, um, of a second. And so um, then you would have another um, num um, another neuron that looks at all those neurons and see and sort of combines them because they all fire together. Sort of uh, encodes the fact that over here is the the voice of the person, over there is the color of the p uh, person, over there is the face of the person, or the the you know the color of a suit, and all of those actually corresponds to one percept, and that could be mediated by these different forms of neuronal firing, for example, by all of all of them firing at once. It, it, it would seem that these broad cycles, though, kind of synchronize everything and kind of leeches out the detailed information that each neuron has to carry. <laughs> yeah, that's a, very, that's a very good point. So somehow, I don't know, I mean, this is the most remarkable thing, particularly when you're recording from the brain. You're listening to individual neurons. We can do that in patients or you do it in, in animals. And you hear this cacophony of sounds. Yeah. And you wonder how, I mean, when I look at you, you're incredible crisp there, right? When I see you, you, you don't waver in and out of existence. You're there really crisp. I can see you and hear you. 
And so how does that, that crisp nature, how does that emerge out of all these uh, messy electro, um, electrical or biochemical interactions? And right now we just don't know. Without, as you say, without it all becoming fuzzy because it's very crisp. Mm. That's, that remains um, a mystery and an unsolved problem. We don't know how it happens. H how can you go further and test whether these broad uh, uh, cycles and frequencies in the brain, which certainly occur, I mean, we, we see that, that clearly means something. How can you begin to test is that a component of, of, of the percept of consciousness? Well, so, so, so first of all, I, I, I beg to differ. We don't really know. Yes, you, we can see brain waves. You see an EEG. You, you put some you know, electrodes on the head, you can see all sorts of oscillations at 10 right. hertz and 20 hertz and yeah. 5 hertz. But they could be epiphenomenal. They could be there. For instance, if I take your laptop computer, one is plugged into the wall, I see a 60 hertz signal. Uh -huh. And if I take your laptop to, to uh, Germany, I see a 50 hertz signal. <laughs> right? That's just the power. Now, we don't believe that that oscillation by itself has anything to do with a computer. That's just the way right. the power is supplied. So in this case, it's epiphenomenal from the point of view of the function your computer has to perf uh, perform. Yet if the, if the power is gone, your computer isn't going right. to work. But we do know that some of these cycles are, are associated with sleep. There's certain kind of cycles with yes, sleep. Yes, they change. And, and with, with uh, rapid eye movement sleep and with, with, with wakefulness. I mean, Yes. So we can use them as diagnostic features, yes. particularly when you're you know, dealing with coma and various people with neurological deficits. But that's not to say yet that they actually have functional value. An analogy is if you go to a cardiologist, okay, he'll take a stethoscope and listen to your heart. So in that case, the sound the heart makes provides high diagnostic value, right? You can hear the boom, boom, and you can hear yes, what the yes. various defects. But there's no evidence that any organ in my brain actually exploits that sound for doing anything, right? Sure. We think it's just a side effect. It radiates some sure, of the energy sure, in the auditory, sure. and you can use that. So that's your analogy. So, so it could be like that. Now, now various people, including Franz Crick myself, at some point or other have said, well, no, there's actually a function that these oscillations have a function. Now, that's much more difficult to establish. So one way to establish is you perturb the system. You somehow mess up the system by adding chemicals or doing electrical stimulation or other fancy techniques that just, that sort of very slightly perturbs it. The, if you if you get gross interference and you haven't shown anything, then you just shown well okay if I you know if I chop down the brain it's not going to work. So you want to interfere very finely with yeah, it, yeah, yeah. so that overall the pattern's still the same, but you've lost the oscillation, and that's yeah. very difficult to do. It's mm -hmm. only it's been done really in a few cases, particular in a in work done and at Caltech by Gilles Laurent in an in an in an insect when the insect is trying to smell and when you can specifically interfere, its neurons are also oscillate just like in a human brain and you can specifically interfere with the, os with the oscillations and you can show that if you interfere with the oscillations, you get some deficits in the behavior. The, 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 the bee in this case cannot do fine order discrimination anymore. So that shows you at least functionally in a very different creature, in a bee, if you interfere with oscillation, you get some loss of function. Yeah, technically, it could still be an epiphenomena because you could be interfering with some other thing that is causing as an epiphenomena, which means it's an artifact, a one-way causation. It the, could, but in this case, it's a little bit more difficult because you're not just interfering. The neurons are still firing, yes. but you've just interfered with them in such a way that they don't oscillate anymore. But uh -huh. they, they, there's still electrical activity going on because if you just kill the electrical activity, while well, all you're shown with no electrical activity, there's no behavior. That's trivial. No, no. So the way they did it, they just perturbed the activity slightly. Mm. Now, there are, of course, like with any complicated experiment, there are various catches. <laughs> but it does seem to show, at least in this, in, at least in B olfactory system, that there is something important about oscillation. If you interfere with them, you get a loss mm. of function. And most people suspect, including myself, that if you, if you interfere, interfere with oscillations in the human brain, you're probably also going to get various def um, uh, deficits, but it's much more difficult to, to, to establish that in a rigorous way. So a, an hypothesis is that oscillations, these gross movements, of, uh, these gross, gross frequencies in the brain, may have some uh, uh, mechanistic way of, of, so, of, of being part of the binding problem, of, of binding different modalities Correct. Together. That would be the hypothesis in this case. Correct. Correct. Yes. And, and is, is, is there not an alternative hypothesis? Yeah, there are various other hypotheses. Some people, some scientists, neuroscientists say, well, there is really no binding problem because the way you combine, you know, if you have this Christmas tree analogy, well, 
by and large, if you go to higher cortical areas, the only activity, so the only electrical candles flickering are the ones that correspond to the thing I'm currently attending to. So if I'm attending to you, there's only a population over here that codes for your face, over here for your voice, here for the motion, and all the other electrical candles are shut off. So in that sense, the binding problem is very easy to solve, and yet that, that you don't need oscillation. Some people say that. Yeah, and that's more of an intention, because what's called the reticular activating system in the lower part of the brain kind of focuses us on one thing or another. Yes, yes. So when, when I'm intending, it looks like I'm suppressing the neural activity cost to non-extend. Uh -uh. So right now I'm looking at you and there's something on the blackboard, but right. because I'm not attending to that, the neural representation of that would be very, very low key. Now, mm -hmm. if I shift my attention to that and look at the blackboard behind you, then its representation is greatly yeah. strengthened and then it comes into my, it becomes conscious to me. There's a second aspect of maintaining this personal identity in addition to the binding problem of, of the momentary unity. This is the momentary unity. The other one is temporal over long periods of time that we're not the same person we were an hour ago or a year ago or certainly 10 years ago. Every molecule may have changed in our bodies. So how do we maintain this absolutely same sense of self? Yeah, we don't really know the mechanisms of that because it's very difficult to investigate those in an animal. Right? Mm. How do you investigate the representation of self in a dog or in a monkey? It may have some <laughs> representation of itself, but it's very difficult to yeah. investigate that. We can really only investigate that in people, and you can't really do the fine manipulations um, uh, that you would like in a, in a, in a human yeah. brain. So we know much less about that than, than we would like to. Clearly, there has to be an active mechanism that constantly does it. This mechanism has to be operating all the time, probably also in sleep, that actively keeps up this person that I am still the same I was yesterday or I was last year. When mom says, look at you, that's when you were four years old, right? right. I have no personal recollection that that's me. Right. But of course, if I'm being told that often enough, then I will tend to associate that picture with me and then I will develop a, a sort of an illusionary person. Oh yeah, that's me. But my mother, my mom could have been malicious and actually pointed at my at my little brother and I probably wouldn't know the difference because I don't connect that person, you know, explicitly to me. How important is this whole question of personal identity, binding problem, temporal uh, relationships in, in understanding what human consciousness is all about? Well, I mean, so the, 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 the key problem, the key philosophical problem, and the, the key problem seems to be for science is the, and the fundamental problem at the heart of the mind-body mystery is why are you conscious of anything? Why are you conscious? Why does it feel like anything to have pain or pleasures or see blue? And so I think once you understand the material basis, if we can understand it, the material basis of having any conscious sensation, let alone the conscious sensation of being me or being in the 25th century in a post, you know, post, you know, post feminist, post industrial <laughs> society, all those much more sophisticated things. I think once you understand the basic mechanism that then we've lifted sort of, we've lifted the cover on one of the central mysteries of the, of the universe. And then there was other things will probably not be quite as, as, as difficult to understand. The other big problem that's somewhat independent of that, the other big, big uh, uh, philosophical conundrum is the problem of, of free will, which is not really the same, but re closely relates to the problem of consciousness, but it's not really the same problem.